Good afternoon. Good afternoon, folks. Good afternoon. It's, uh, Charles McNamara here, the director of operations with Guardian Group Services. Today we got a really good guest, folks. Um, this individual is a great instructor. Have been looking forward to doing training with them for a while, um, just because they've really been in this industry for a very long time. You know, getting to know the training staff. Um, very important at Guardian Group Services. Uh, so our instructor today that we're going to talk to is instructor Anthony Kearney. He's got three decades, three decades in this industry. He's a seasoned professional with experience in fire safety, field operations, investigations, drug testing, court appearances. I mean, you name it, uh, instructor Kearney has done it. Also, um, decades of managerial investigations experience um, as a degree. We'll get into that as well from Mercer College. And, you know, looking at the numbers, I'm amazed. Instructor Kearney has taught over 20,000 students with his career um, at Guardian Group Services. So first and foremost, good afternoon, Instructor Kearney. How are you? I'm fine, Charles. Thanks so, for the introduction. I'm, you're making me sound older now. Now I feel like I'm going to retire. <laughs> get my rocking chair out now. <laughs> yeah, I, I always get a kick out of introducing other people. I'm like, man, you know, look at this guy. He's doing it 20 years. Look at this girl. She's been doing it for 30 years, 25 years. And then I think about me. I'm like, oh, man, I've been doing this for two decades as well. I got the grays coming in. That's why I shaved my head. <laughs> oh, nice. I didn't have any more grays. I didn't want to lose any more. So forget it. Just take them off. <laughs> so, you, you know, I, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me and our students because I know some are watching live right now. So hello, students. And some might watch later uh, after they complete uh, a training course with us. So you, you mentioned you wanted to talk about three things in yes. particular. Um, you know, starting out as a new security guard, which is really important. Um, and what the employer's expectations are, um, really good topic. We're going to get into that. Um, I always tell people the job is not what you think it's going to be. Um, <laughs> the other topic you wanted to talk about, which is really important. I think, especially for new security guards, it's a little easier to understand and learn this. Um, what are post orders and standard operating procedures? <laughs> Sometimes people that have been on a job site for a long time, they might get complacent or they don't know things have changed, or management has just never updated the books, um, which is really important. I'm, I'm glad you wanted to talk about that. Um, and the third topic, which you mentioned, the limitations as a private security guard. Um, really, 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 really interesting stuff because I always tell people the job is not what you think it is. Um, it's what your employer is gonna tell you what it is. And it's important to know your post orders, and your job specifically. Uh, we're going to get into the details of, you know, the state training, what you can and can't do. But I think for the majority of security officers and folks you're watching, you drop a comment, let me know. Uh, I think for the majority, you're going to be working solo. You might work with like a small team of people, um, but you always have a supervisor or a manager, somebody that you can call. But at the end of the day, you've got to kind of handle business right there on the spot, right? So you got to know your job and what to do specifically. Um, you know, so one thing I kind of want to ask you, Instructor Kearney, what do you feel are common traits of a great instructor? I know that we have a hybrid. We do training in person. We do a lot of training online, but I'd love to get your thoughts on what makes a good instructor. Well, I would say that you know, it's it it, it it happens over time. It's not an over it's not an overnight sensation, but when you can tie in, make you know, connect the dots from textbook knowledge to practicality. What happens in the field? What's the real world about? Mm -hmm. Right? Because you read about it, and then you know you see videos, you see all these things, different things. Then you come to wait, hold it. Uh, I didn't see this in the book or. You know they don't t they didn't tell us that in the class you know we don't want to have that experience for people not to know before my especially for me personally i don't want anyone to leave my class without having an understanding of what the job entails 
what they have to put in because you're on the spot. Day one, you got to hit the ground running. What does that mean? You got to be prepared for whatever. And I don't know whatever it is because locations are different. Like Charles said, you could be in retail, you could be in a hospital, you could be at college, you could be at a university, you could be at a warehouse, you could be at a, a you know outdoor you know events. There's different types of settings, residential buildings, commercial buildings, right? You could be doing a, you know, you could be anywhere. Yeah, and yeah. it's not the same post orders, right? I, it's not going to be the same. I remember my first job doing security um, came right out of the military. I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I know I wanted to be a police officer, but, you know, I had to wait. I was on the wait list. So the first security job I did uh, was at a warehouse. Mm -hmm. They had a separate building on the opposite side, which is a high rise office building. Mm -hmm. Two totally different ways to secure a building. Um, you know, we were, you know, very proactive. We would go out and do patrols. You know, we're in the warehouse, we're in the nitty gritty, you know, looking for things where people hide things to steal. Um, but when I got to the office building, I, I just assumed it was kind of like the same thing. Like, yeah, I need to go check behind that person's desk and go in there. You know, did they steal a laptop or microprocessors? And I got in a lot of trouble my very first job. As I, did, I never really read the post office, uh, post orders. And I was just kind of afraid to ask questions because I'm like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. I was told, but I was told for that site, not this site. Good, good point. Um, you know, so Instructor Kearney, you, you know, you're certified, right, by New York State. You're a DCJS instructor. But I had the pleasure of taking a, a training, a train the trainer class with you recently. What mm -hmm. other things do you teach besides security? Oh, boy. Well, I, I just I want to tell a short story about my first security job. Okay. Sure. Um, and I hope the Department of Labor from New Jersey doesn't come after me. But this was in 1966. My first security job, I was five years old. And uh, there was a factory across the street, I mean, down the street from my house on the dead end street called B&D, Beck and Dickinson. And it was a security guard by the name of Jack that worked there. So I don't know, I stumbled upon it coming down the hill from my, you know, to make the left to go into my house. And I said, I just, just walked in there. And the guy said, hey, where are you going? I said, uh, no, I just, it was just looking around, little kid, right? So then, I don't know, I just got an acquaintance with him. And then what happened was I used to stop in there and see him before I go home. My mother said, well, where will you go? I said, well, I just went down the street to see the, you know, see Jack. She said, who's Jack? I said, uh, that's the guy that's down there. She's like, what, who's this guy, Jack? So it comes, she come to find out as a security guard. So I got a job <laughs> relieving Jack to go to the bathroom or go to get lunch. <laughs> so I would run home from school, right, early, so I could, you know, meet with Jack and get home in time for Batman. Because Batman came on at 3.30 or 4, sometimes 3, I think 3.30 or 4 o'clock. So I had to run home from school. I went straight to the went, went straight to relieve him, right? I don't know how it developed. Don't don't remember how it all developed. And um, that was my first security job, and uh, he paid me. And uh, uh, just the saying it was off the books, folks. But uh, the Department of Labor don't come after me now because I'm not paying for all of those absent years that I didn't pay my taxes. <laughs> <laughs> but that was my first security job. I awesome. believe that. The people would say, well, where's Jack? I said, well, he went to the bathroom. Well, Jack went to the store. He'll be right back. Can I help you with anything? He gave me the he said, he gave me the line. I knew the post order. He gave me the post order. I said, just say this, Tony. Just tell him that I just stepped out. I'll be right back and tell him, you know, I just went to step up the street, uh, the Geishans to get something and whatever and come back. And that was it. So that was my first <laughs> house. <laughs> that, that is amazing. And, and, you know, it's funny, too, because, you know, as we were just saying, sometimes, you know, you're the only guard. You're working by yourself. <laughs> Need a hand, and sometimes just, and there was you know, no relief. I never saw all the years that I lived there. I never saw a supervisor come and relieve them. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I think that's important too. You know, as a guard, you kind of have to understand, you know, how the operation works. Um, a lot of times, you know, you might be by yourself. Um, you might have to wait for a relief, a face-to-face -face relief, mm -hmm. to maybe get a meal, or maybe you know, you're ending your tour. Uh, you know, so when you're starting out, you really got to know the post orders. But 
how things really play out, you know, hour by hour on your shift. Yeah, um, I, I worked on, I worked on a college campus at Fairleigh Dickinson University and they had post one and post two, which were guard booths. And post one was by the student center. So mm -hmm. it was walking distance, but I couldn't, but according to the post orders, you had to wait until one of the walking patrol guards or the guy that was on in the car was coming by or you called them on the radio for a, a relief. Mm -hmm. Now, if you know what I know, you reach a point when you, you got to go to the bathroom point of no return where you got to go. And it's like, you got to go now. Otherwise, you're going to be looking like you went already. <laughs> so, you know, and I <laughs> that's the and what happened was. If anybody to catch me going to the bathroom, I said I called in for relief. I called the guy who was on patrol. He wasn't he wasn't answer the phone. Called the guy and the two guys is two guys who are post three and post seven. Hey, post three, this is uh, post one. I need a relief. Post four, seven, I need a relief. Radio silent, crickets. Nobody's answering. So I reached the point of no return. I go to the run to the student center, come back. Who catches me on the way back? Not the supervisor. The director of security for the college campus catches me. Hey, what are you doing up post? I said, I got to go. I had to go to the bathroom. He said, you're supposed to wait for a relief. I said, an hour? I called post three, seven, five, and nobody responded. But you got to wait for a relief. I said, I waited for an hour. And I just said, I just left it as that. Because I said, I couldn't go anywhere. Okay. But yeah, you have to you know that there's post orders and procedures in place. But this was like, a, this was a different situation. This was just a different situation. All right, but... Yeah, I know so, for, for, for me, you know, becoming an instructor, you know, I, I was always one, I always like to kind of give information to others, you know, and, and that was a challenge as, as my first, you know, supervisor job, just making people understand that, you know, you can't just leave your post unattended, but sometimes, mm -hmm. hey, you got to do what you got to do, especially when you got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> um, you know, kind of like to know a little bit about, you know, your background and um, why and how did you become an instructor? Like, what was that process for you? How did you become an instructor? Well, what happened was, um, you, now you're telling, now I'm really telling my, my age. I, actually, I've been in the industry over 45 years, but I, but uh, I started out in New Jersey. But when I came to New York, um, I was working for a company called Summit Security. And um, <clears throat> let me see, I started with them in 19... I think it was 87, 87. And I had, I, I, yeah, I started with them in 87. Anyhow, long story made short is that the security guard law, the security guard act of 1992 that took effect January 1st of 1994. Um, it was written into law July 17th. And what happened, what preceded that was that there were two incidents that occurred in the security industry in New York state. One was uh, at Carl Place High School where security guard shot and killed two people and wounded three others while he was on duty. And was on the, at the time, he was on probation for weapons and drug convictions. And then a uh, security guard that worked up at uh, as a contract security guard for uh, the college university upstate, I mean, up, uptown Manhattan. I'll leave the school name out, but um, hmm. but the point is that the guard raped a college student on campus. Oh my God. Hmm. All right, so the state got involved and set up an advisory council to look into the security industry back in the early 1990, 1991. And what the advisory council came up with is that minimum training standards were not kept up. Literally folks, somebody could walk out of prison today, Friday, today's October the 20th, and be working Monday, October 23rd, without having a background check done. So they decided that they, you know, their recommendations to the Department of State Division of Licensing, to Division of Licensing, was to overhaul the security industry, to make everyone in the state of New York have a state background check as well as an FBI background check. At that time, we were only doing a New York State background check, so it wasn't it wasn't efficient enough. And the training, the actual date of start of the Security Guard Act in terms of actually doing the training. Um, companies were put on an odd and even year system. So if you hired somebody in an odd year, and this was in 1994, was an even year. So all the people that you hired in the even year, you had to get them licensed. And then 
by the you can get the other people licensed, but the priority had to be for all the people that were in the even year because 1994 was the even year, and then 1995 you did the odd year people, right? So that way you have time to catch up to everybody in your company. No excuses. So that's how it started off, and then after that, after that two year period, every year everybody knew had to be. You know, uh, everybody knew it had to be licensed, but you know they they gave us a two year grace period of getting that done. Now, what happened was that um, who's going to train these people? <laughs> right? It's like okay, you said you're going to get them trained, an eight hour pre assignment course and a sixteen hour course. Who's going to do it? So I was the uh, director of personnel for Summit. Right. So I put in. My information, you know, that I was, you know, working for the company, and you know, you know, my experience and from you know, me having interviewed and hired and fired people and trained and you know, just got them trained and went on the work site and stuff like that. So they qualified me to get my instructor's license. So they, you know, sent my company and sent me, you know, my instructor's license to my office at the at Summit Security, and um, so the law took effect January first of nineteen ninety four. If you do the math, uh, if you go back in time, I think January second, nineteen ninety four, was a Monday, and we started our training on Monday, January second, nineteen ninety four. So I've been doing this since the first week that it started. Um, that, you know, um, for me, it was a little different. I, I got mine right after the military, so probably the late nineties, ninety nine, two thousand. Um, you know, I had to sit through uh, a train the trainer course with. Mm -hmm. uh, DCJS, great group of people. Um, it was the first time I was actually exposed to like really detailed public speaking um, and training. And you know, ever since then, I've always made it a goal to try to you know learn a new certification. You and I had the pleasure of doing something in person at Guardian. We had New York State come down you know, to do the OC spray. I thought that was really fun. I had a good time with you and mm -hmm. and Matt and everybody else that was there. Even some of our instructors. I've taken this as well, um, but you teach a lot of other stuff as well, right? You yeah. Teach well, well, I, I did. Um, what happened was um, I was working for I think I was working for Summit, and they had me do some private investigation work, right? Mm -hmm. So in doing that, I got in, in, interested in that, and then I got a call from um, somebody that said that uh, would you be interested in teaching that? So it was SCI Superior Career Institute. Okay. So so I got um, I got they well say well look you got to have certain certifications in like in like a it's almost like a a, a training coach class. Yeah. You know, training you know like a training a training a teacher class anyhow. So mm -hmm. I got those credentials and then I became uh, an instructor for um, TCI uh, private investigation. So I was teaching private investigation for them. Okay. So that's how I got that training, um, and, and it's just like it's just like you, you come into the business and you never know who you're gonna meet up with, right? Oh yeah. Right. Right. So also, uh, I'm licensed to teach uh, real estate. I teach real. I teach real estate too. God, did not know that. I'm learning yeah, something today too. Real estate, you know. I I, and what happened because I worked in it years back, and then, you know, um, a company that you know that I had went to classes for. I took, you know. And they said, well, or do you teach? And I said, no. They said, well, how come you don't teach? I said, well, what is it? Then I looked at it. I said, well, they said, well, you don't have, you just have to have enough credentials of teaching. So I put together all the stuff that I had in terms of teaching, you know, teach, you know, you know, other places and stuff like that. And the, and the state approved me. They, I had to get a hundred points, I think it is. Yeah. Hundred points. <laughs> but and then I was able to teach. Then COVID hit, and then I just said, you know what? You know, it, it kind of like. Because the you know buildings closed down and so forth, and there's a lot of a lot of people not out there you know working doing it. But you, um, know, you, you hit something right on the head too. Um, you know, both of us have been in the training field and management field and investigation field for a couple of decades. But when COVID came upon us, you know, a lot of people were kind of like two different minds about it. You're right. People still needed training. You know, there was. Um, a lot of people saying, you know, I don't want to do this work anymore. And other people took full advantage. They, I'm home. Why not do some training? You know, we do it online. I know that you do the security guard program. You do the fire guard prep. You do the F80. You have an FLSD 
group that's going on right now. I think you're in the middle yeah. of, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you're a man of many talents and, you know. Well, what happened to qualify, one of the qualifications for me that stood out was that um, I've been on both spectrums of security. Mm -hmm. I worked in the contract security side, right? And I knew understood understood what, you know, contract security, but also in-house security. But the flip side to that is uh, alarm, alarm security, alarm division. So I worked as a central station manager for Honeywell for almost four years. So I ran a central station. So everything that we're going through, the, 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 the coordinator jobs, the F-80s, the F-95s, the F fire, fire, fire life safety directors, building management, you know, property managers, they all had to call the central station because nobody called the fire department when yeah. there was an alarm going off, they called me. You know, so I was the central station manager. So I had a central station. I was the manager. I had a serviceman. I had technicians. I had guard alarm response agents. All of them were armed. They all had to be armed, right? And I had a gun custodian there on the spot. Plus I, you know, ran the, um, <clears throat> We call the installation department on Saturday. So I was the installation manager on Saturdays when I worked. All right. So I ran installation on Saturdays, ran the central station on the nights and the weekends that I worked there. But I learned a lot about what we do now from the central station because the signals were coming in from from your buildings, from the buildings, from security company buildings. All right. So if they didn't call me, or if it was a hospital, a college, a university, they had a a, a a 15 to 20 second window depend upon what type of place it was now if it was a hospital you didn't play it look you got 15 seconds if you call me 17 seconds it's out nope fire department's on the way gone can't play with that hold up alarm 10 seconds wow because this is life or death hold up alarm is somebody's there with a weapon right a bank robbery you got you got 10 seconds right we're not doing anything <laughs> there's a tone of thumps. i can't take it back nope i can't take it back it's gone it's out yeah you know that's a lot of people don't understand too especially you know if you're in security you might have the ability to like a trip for a silent alarm you know and they don't play when they get those alarms they respond i mean on a dime myself yep. I, i've been you know one of those guys where you know you step away five seconds, the alarm goes off and you, literally you just run into the command station, uh, you know, to try to get to that panel. But, you know, th those systems are in place for a reason, right? They're kind of like a backup, you know, to get the professionals there. What, what was your experience like working um, with the central station? I'm pretty sure you've dealt with thousands of calls, right? Oh, thousands of calls, break-ins, burglaries, you know, you know, the Ocean's 11, 12 and 13? Yeah. <laughs> with the was it was it you got Matt Damon you got uh who does it Brad that? Pitt she, uh Brad Pitt um uh what's the what's the um uh, it's, it's a couple of stars in there right there's a comedian yeah. in there but I laugh because those are those are real that's real people try to compromise your alarm system by cutting into splicing into the the alarm alarm circuit mm -hmm. and try to get a give you an erroneous what we call a night signal meaning that everything is close down and if they splice in and you don't catch it they can be in there for a day two days three days four days and and wipe out the whole bank that so that's how i first learned about like pots lines people would tell me you know you got to check the pots lines i'm like what are you talking about but that's exactly you know what you're saying people compromise the line going in going out right yeah because so i had a, a one company's warehouse and every saturday this alarm would go off i said is somebody trying to set me up? Because every Saturday, this daggone thing is going off. And I just <laughs> sent an alarm response agent to reset the alarm. He says, okay, no, Tony's just okay. I said, well, this is every Saturday. Same time, around well, the same time. I said, look, all right, forget about the, the alarm service, guys. I sent the technician. He could. He didn't find a problem. I said, you ain't there better than the guard, you know? Yeah. So I said, you know what? I said, you know what? I need you guys. I took two servicemen, right? I said, look, I got to pull you off a job to get this job done. Because this is wrecking my brain. Yep. Why this alarm is going off every Saturday. So sure enough, this alarm went off on Saturday. I said, you guys, you two guys head there. You go and find this problem because I'm tired of this problem. <laughs> so, so they traced it from 
the zone to the alarm panel and it was metal tubing you know all the way around except for a certain i think maybe like a wall it was rubber tubing and mm -hmm. what happened was the rats had eaten through the rubber and it got into the copper and that was triggering the alarm <laughs> that is insane yeah wow. so it was driving me crazy charles for for weeks and months i was like what why can't you guys find this problem i sent the servicemen in and then they rewired it they took they said look we're gonna tell the company i said well i'll get in touch with the installation and see what the client wants they said look we need to put you told look we need to put metal in there because your alarm's going off okay so we put you know put metal piping in there so you get to understand you know what problems that they have in terms of especially you know folks when you guys get jobs and if you work in a building and you come to understand that if you get into the fire safety side where systems have to go offline well you had to call me central station and yeah. let me know hey tony you know this is uh st luke's hospital uh we, look we're working on our standpipe system working on sprinkler system we're going to be offline all right, all right, Joe, let me know when you're back online because if I get him anything is going out, you know that, right? So Joe has to tell me, Tony is back online, right? You know, so it's very, very important as you move up in the industry and you go from guard to fire guard, fire safety, a coordinator, whatever it is, that you understand you got to have a working relationship with the central station because yeah. your building is dependent upon that. If, if you get too many false alarms, you know what the fire department will say? Here's your violation. I'll see you in ECB court. <laughs> uh, how about we will notify your insurance company that you oh, no longer yeah. have the fire department to come to respond to your office. You are shut down. Yeah. They will shut you down. Your, your policy just went up by like a million dollars. Oh, listen, listen you, you don't have a building. They said, look, don't don't open. You can't open up the building tomorrow. Because I always forget the term. Uh, was it un, unnecessary alarm or unwarranted alarm? That'll lead to that. They don't care which one of one of is if they gotta come there for nothing, everything is unwanted. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> they, they cuss like a sailor at you. Look yep. that blah 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 blah. And I said, Well, look, I told you folks to get that fixed, you know. You know, but uh yeah, we tell people, you know, if you're having a problem, don't wait for the fire department to get on your back. Because they you don't want them on your back. You want to be able to say, I'm sorry, but I, I spoke to my central station and they're going to have a serviceman come. That's all they want to know. They don't want to know nothing about your problems. Yeah. How, what they are you doing to fix it? Solutions. Absolutely. They just want solutions. solutions. They don't want problems. If you deal with the fire department, give them solutions. Don't give them answers to things they already know. They know that you got a problem with your alarm. Fix it. That's all they want to know. And who's coming to fix it, when they're coming to fix it. No. Otherwise, you, know, you don't find it. You mentioned something, you know, um, if we talked about the central station component. And you kind of started to talk about something else, which is really good for our students to know. There is a, a, a career path, really. If you are looking to make more money, there's nothing wrong with saying that. Um, you know, getting those certifications, right? Getting your FL1, getting your FL2, your FL3, your FL4, your S95. The more things that you can add to your resume will make you more valuable, make you more attractable a candidate, uh, attractive candidate. And as you take on that responsibility, there's going to be more things that you need to know, especially when it comes to policies and procedures. Um, and a lot of times people are not going to check in with you when they're working upstairs. They're just going to do their work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I was fortunate to have a lot of positive influences, people that have helped me in my career um, on the security side, on the fire side, on the military, the, the emergency operations. I, I always... I'm thankful and, and happy to say I, I'm glad for the people that I've had bring me up throughout the career. And it's kind of why I started doing these. So I would love to know um, from you, who's had the most positive influence on your career? Um, two people. Um, one person, he became a supervisor of the fire safety directors. And we were working for Summit. And he had, let me see, three or four buildings that he was a fire safety director, but the company appointed him with the, uh, the client that we were doing, I think was Swig, Wall and Arnold. They wanted him, they wanted us to promote him and put him as the supervisor of fire safety directors. So he went from 
1411 Broadway to 111 West 40th to 7 Hanover Square, he went to all the buildings to supervise the fire safety directors. Mm. So I was impressed by that. <laughs> right? That was one person. And the other person that, you know, this is, you know, if you could turn the music down, this is a very important story. Just a little bit. Absolutely. This, yeah. This is a friend of mine that we worked together at um, Summit Security. And he got a job working for, uh, a, you know, uh, property management. I forgot the you know, name will escape me. And um, he was always about getting people jobs. So he was from Jamaica. He was Jamaican. And everybody from Jamaica says, Tony, I got a guy from Jamaica. Come on, he's going to come and get a job for you. All right? Get him the license and make sure he does the fingerprints and make sure he takes the training and everything. And he spent his life. He got his kids jobs. He spent his life getting, he was a property manager for Phipps Housing, and he was still work. I said, what, what do you what, what do you take a break, George? Right? So the long story made short, this I I never met, and I probably will never met meet anybody that would meet up to the standard. Because he said a bar standard I couldn't keep, you know, because everybody he saw that he knew that came from his country, he tried to do his best to make sure that he got him a job. And being that he was in the security industry and he knew I was in the security industry, he wouldn't be calling me. To make sure that everything gets done mm -hmm. but this is how much dedication this guy had he died about about 10 11 years ago he never told me that he was dying of cancer up to two weeks before he died he was still sending me people to get licensed and get in the industry Tony take care of this guy take care of this lady da, da, da. and I found out about two or three months before he died from his assistant manager that he I said George you didn't I said George you you didn't tell me that what he says Tony I couldn't tell you he says I'm sorry I couldn't tell you but I found out from his assistant manager but up to two weeks before he passed he was complaining to me that I wasn't working fast enough to get the people the job I said George he just finished the training how he said let, let, let me get the license for a person so I said, make sure the license goes through make sure everything gets done Two weeks before he's passing, he's still bringing me people and complaining that I ain't doing it fast enough. Oh man, I can't, I can't, I can't match it. I can't. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a kid compared to him because what he did was he says, "Look, this is how I want you to do. I want you to help people understand how to get from a security guard to property management." And he gave me all the information that he needed that I would need for anybody that wanted to get to property management. Now, this is a person that's, you know, months, weeks and months away from his dead, deathbed and still doing his death. Nothing happened. So phenomenal people, because, you know, the guy that was a supervisor for five safety directors, you know, he was just everybody, you know, the client. Imagine if you have a, uh, a supervisor, right? And the client says, take him out of the building and put somebody to replace him and put him to supervise all of our commercial buildings and we will pay for that. What kind of person do you think that you got there working for you? If your client says, take him out the building as a fire safety director and make him supervisor of all of our buildings. I, right. That's, that's, I can't, I can't, I can't even articulate it in words. It's always amazing to see, you know, the real true grit of, of some people like they will grind it out every day. Nothing will get them down and they just kind of drive forward. Um, I'm sorry for the loss. Um, sounds like a great individual to know. And uh, it, it's a shame you don't see that many people like that with that drive and just really who are compassionate and want to help people. He, he would um, cut, he would cut down your recruitment of security guards. He'd be sending he'd be funneling people to you, or <laughs> sending people all, like Charles help, Charles hey Charles I got a guy for you a good man send him put him to work man. He's he, he would he you don't have to you don't have to have a recruiter that was your recruiter you can use him. Yeah, and it's important too, uh, you know sometimes in a lot of guard companies training kind of gets put to the side and the mindset is. Higher, 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 higher. You can have a hundred guards, but only maybe ten percent might be actually good guards. Everybody else is kind of a body. Um, so you know, I, I got a list here. What what I thought 
you know, what are important things that a security guard who is new, they need to know laws and regulations, right? You need to know your company's policies, the client's rules and regulations. You're going to be the one enforcing them, <laughs> right? So, yeah. you know, if you, if you don't like to deal with people, this is probably not a good job for you because you are going to work with people. Um, some people might get under your skin, um, but some people might try to break a rule. Oh, I got, I forgot my ID. Come on, let me in. Or some people might be up to no good committing a crime. So um, communication skills, I think, are really important for every security guard. You have to know how to talk to people, change your tone of voice, how to t scale it back and sometimes ramp it up a little bit, um, depending on where you work. Most importantly, observe and report. You've got to keep your head on a swivel, got to pay attention to what's going on. You can't be looking down at the phone or, um, you know, be distracted and you have to get in the habit of reporting. That is your job, right? Write things down and report. Um, you, this is really important. Um, I feel you need to be physically and mentally fit to do the job. Um, it's very easy to get out of shape. It's very easy to get stressed out in this line of work. Um, I'd love to know your thoughts, folks who are watching live. Put them in the comments. What are, what are your top five? And the last one I will say, security technology. I know the way you and I used to do things has definitely changed. You know, you go around with the old Morse code, watch me. Oh, oh, listen, that was the birth of Flavor Flav. <laughs> <laughs> yep. The big I clock. I tell people, I said, I give them the analogy. I said, you know Flavor Flav? Everybody says, yes. I said, well, that was our technology. We had a VTEX clock and you put the key in, turn it, and then it then it puts the, it types the, on the page, on the tape inside the clock, what time it was there. I said, I'm I'm trying to find one of those. Uh, I've looked on eBay and then Google. Probably, I can't find a good working one. They're probably buried in some 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 bay somewhere. They're, they're gone. They're, they're like, no. It, it'll probably cost a hundred dollars to ship. No, that thing is going to be so it, big. Yeah. <laughs> let things in the past. Stay yeah, in the yeah past. Let, let it. You know, people say, "Man, you're old, man. I don't even know what a detex clock looks like." <laughs> uh, but, you know, so it was, but it was accurate, though. You got to got to you got to know that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And you know, you got to stay up to date with trends, you know, things change. A lot of the things now are QR codes. They just scan them. Um, but security technology changes and we got to oh, yeah. change. Well, you know, I mean, just with the security guard act, um, we didn't ever think back in the 1990s that we'd be talking about terrorism and topics like that. I never yeah. envisioned that that would happen, but the things that have happened in New York and, you know, stuff like that and, it's in the it's in it's in the u.s so you're like hey you know what you can't like walk with blinders on thinking that you know it, it can't happen so that's been incorporated into our training so that was important all right yeah. but i would just say just starting out you know one of the things that i think that people get a little bit apprehensive about is trying to over please the client never ever over please the client what does that mean yeah. anybody have any idea what does over the over please the client mean you have to post orders and procedures but you want to over please the client what is, would anybody have any idea what that might mean hmm. put it in the chat if you can let's see, let's see right. if got oh we got jimmy rice jimmy what's up man what's going on jimmy was a previous student good people is from facebook good to see you um uh, highly recommends us i wonder if jimmy's going to answer that question um, you know, it's funny, it's, I'm going to kind of answer that while some people are, are typing. I really didn't understand contracts until I became a director of security. Mm -hmm. I was one of those security managers, whatever the client wants, we got to get it for them. Sometimes things would be out of the scope of work. And now I'm taking resources from the company I'm working for, just basically giving away the house <laughs> for, for some of the things mm -hmm. that they wanted. Uh, you know, I got, you know, spanked a couple of times for doing that, but, um, you know, you gotta stick to what is in the contract, uh, and what's in your scope of work. Um, and a lot of times what would happen, especially cause we were on Madison Avenue, a lot of fancy stores, but it was right near grand central. So there's a lot of crime. There's a lot of EDPs, a lot of, you know, just unstable people and, you know, things that go down and, and jump off. 
-hmm. We would get calls all the time. Hey, can you go outside and remove this person? Or hey, can you go, you know, apprehend this person? Can't do it. It's not in my post orders. No, no, go ahead. Don't worry. You know, we don't you know, worry. We okay, yeah. That's how you know you're getting trouble. Yeah, don't worry. Don't worry. That's the, those are the key words. When they say don't worry, that is the key word. That's buzzwords for be concerned that you get yourself in trouble. Mm -hmm. Right. But um, I, I give you a case in point where a guard wanted to appease the client. Um, we used to have, uh, well, the, 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 the newest version of AMP was food emporiums, right? They went from AMP to food emporiums, right? Mm -hmm. So we had food emporium uh, for a client for a thing of summit and 14th Street Union Square, right? So there was a guard that was working from 8.30 p.m to 5 a.m. because they were 24 hours because Food Emporium, uh, 14th Street Union Square, 24 hours A&P. That was one of the first A&Ps that I known. Well, one of the only, actually the only one that we had that was open 24 hours a day, right? So what happened, Charles, is that <clears throat> this guy was sometimes mostly coming late, two or three days a week. And then I finally got him on track to come on time. And then all of a sudden, he started coming in at eight o'clock. No big deal, right? You wouldn't think 8 o'clock is a big deal. Then 7.30. 7.30. Hour early? You know what? I go get something to drink. And I said, look, he's logged in already. I got him checked in. I'm, you know, checking in my people. Mm -hmm. Then 7 o'clock. Then 6.30. I said, wait, he says, hey, Tony, I'm, in, I'm around. Just want to let you know I'm, 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 in, I'm in Union Square. So I'm here. Don't worry. You don't have to check me in later. I said, something is up. I said, I said, I'm not a, I'm from the streets and something is up, Charles. Something is up. You're like watching something, that guy. Yeah. I said, something is up. So I didn't want him to know that I was coming down there. The next day he called me about him being in early, like six o'clock. I said, I had my supervisor. I said, all right, hit him up. Shoot down there. This guy at the request of the manager was coming in either hour and a half to two hours early to unload trucks for the super for the supermarket getting paid cash off the books getting a free lunch you know how you go to the deli and they give you a whole they give him a ticket you get a yep. free full full dinner two and two and a two and two to two and a half hours early working unloading trucks before he started his security shift. Hmm. Now he did all of this to appease the client, but he was getting some compensation for it. But you can't do that. I said, look, now this is for folks. Hopefully you never get encountered that. Do not do that. But don't, if, if there are, let's say new post orders at a site, then you have to go to your management, your supervisor, your account manager, and speak to them first before you step foot into any new procedure it's got to be approved by your company, your security company. Why? For a couple of reasons. The most important reason for you is this. Charles, if you work at Food Emporium as a security guard, right? You got your security license and you're doing your patrol and something happens during your patrol, you get injured. You're 100% covered, right, Charles? Yep. Now, if you're doing something that's not in the post orders and procedures, what happens is that when you go to apply for a workman's comp, they send an investigator down to check the location out and to check what you what your post orders and procedures are and what you wrote up as the reason for why you were injured on the job. To see if you qualify. You pay for workman's compensation insurance, but you still gotta qualify. The big Q word is qualify. Right? So if you get injured. Right on the job, like this guy was off the job, so he wouldn't have gotten paid for that. But if the manager told you, Hey, I want you to push carts in the store, right? Push shopping carts, and you happen to push a cart and slip and fall, and then they go and check the post orders and they say Anthony Kearney was on duty, he was legally licensed, licensed security guard assigned to that store. That was his schedule, he was working there, he wasn't intoxicated, nothing wrong with him. But he's disqualified. We looked at his post orders and procedures. 
and nothing in there states that he is supposed to be pushing shopping carts together. So he is now disqualified from getting disability insurance. So that's how you lose. Now, what you're supposed to do, not say, hey, I don't want to do this. It's not in post order of procedures. No, don't get into a conflict with the client. Say, uh, before I'm able to start any new post orders and procedures, I got to check with my uh, account manager, uh, Mr. Uh, Charles McNamara, uh, to make sure that we put it in properly and then we have proper documentation of that. It's, That's what you do. Or have my, I'll have my supervisor or have my account manager call you, but I will let them know that you want this uh, to be instituted as soon as possible and they will get back to you. It's That's so it's so funny you say that i mean literally something just came right back to me because that would happen often especially in like inclement weather especially with snow clients would say you know listen nobody's coming in we only got you know uh one guy on maintenance can can the guys come out and help shovel i would always want to help but i remember from experience someone else a security guard went outside to, to help shovel um and they, they literally all the gentleman just threw out his threw out his back slipped and fell and i mean just really got messed up and wrecked um you know had to have an ambulance and when they tried to go um, they tried to go to workers comp and just take time off um it, it kind of jammed them up because they had video it's not in his post orders he just wanted to be helpful uh, it was a it's a tough predicament to be in and i agree with you 100 percent whether you're a guard or a supervisor, you're always going to have to get approval for somebody else. And then I need that in writing to kind of cover you. Cover um, yourself. And cover what yourself. drove it home to me was also a safety issue, Yeah. right? That you assess the safety. Like, for example, there was a guard, I guess, between 10, 15 years ago, working at what? Walmart in Long Island. And it was, uh, what is it? It was coming up on that day. Right? The day, right? Now... I'm, I'm not, I, I don't want to sound biased, but you know, there's not too many guys that's getting up at three o'clock in the morning to get that first you know, toaster or whatever. It's a, a free TV, but change, times have changed. But the situation was that one guard in this, I think it was in Nassau County and yeah. a line of people, men and women, right. And one guard to open up the, open up the store at what? Three or four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. I know, yeah. This. Folks, the man got trampled to death. Tragedy. Sad. And people walked over him to go into the store to still buy. And, and I you thought know, about I, that. I, I'm just amazed, you know, and, and we'll kind of get into this with planning, right? Because when you know, we talk in, um, and this kind of leads into the next question about training, right? You know, we, both of us um, do both training, but some things work well online some things work well in person for training but you said this earlier you have to be prepared for anything right so if you're doing security at a retail establishment what could go wrong right well there's crime there's theft there's slip and falls there's medical emergencies wait, wait, can you stop with, can you stop with the slip and fall stop right there when we did the in-person class i demonstrated the slip and fall and how they could get how they could get sued people like people do that i said yes they do they're grimy oh, yeah. like that so oh, that yeah. was one thing i miss i miss i miss the personal interaction sometimes because when people say how do you know people i said this this can happen to you right because yeah. they say you find out the most meticulous of things i say yes i said why do I, why do i ask people i said before i do that the slip and fall i said why do they put the glass bottles of ketchup on the lower shelves and the plastic ones on the on the upper shelves. <laughs> hmm? Why they switch it around? Right? Uh, yeah, if you're reaching from glass up top, easy no, to hit yourself, hit others. No, when you put it up higher, when it and it splatters, it makes a bigger spill. So that way, you wear a nice white shirt and you slip and fall and you spread it all over your shirt. And, and if nobody <laughs> saw, if nobody saw you on camera. You just lay down there until somebody comes by and you say, you know, my, my back is out. My back is hurting. Yeah. And, you know, and the stores, if they don't have no camera going, what they got to do? They got to settle out of court. They're going to yell. They're going to shout. They're going to settle. Only $30,000. You know, the lawyer gets a third. So it's just 30000 lawyer gets 10. The guy gets 20. The woman gets 20. And they keep it moving. But people say, well, how do you watch this? I said, look, 
there's a lot of different things. I said, do you know about the person that's the, um, we call the backdoor shoplifter? They said, who's the back? What's the, what are you talking about? What does that mean? They don't know. I said, because we created these terms for us so that we know, you know, like, hey, Charlie, Charlie, he's a backdoor. Yep. All right. Now the backdoor shoplifter is this. That person wants to mo make the most amount of money, the least amount of time, and the least amount of effort as a shoplifter. Now, how do they do that? They don't go into a store and pick, put something into their pocket and conceal it and try to get past the cameras. No. <clears throat> they capitalize on people that come into this country. We call them with a T. What's the T word? The, the T people. No. Tourists? Tourists. 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 Because you never heard of broke tourists, have you? No. Right? You never heard of broke tourists. They always come here with money. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. So so when they go from one store to the next store after they buy stuff, right, they they accumulate bags, right? If they went to Lord & Taylor's, then they go to Saks, then they go to Bloomingdale's, whatever, whatever, right? At some point, they're going to get into a store where they're going to see something, and that four-letter word throws men and women into trance. What's it in the store? What's that four-letter word? Sale. Sale. <laughs> so when they see that sale, all they got to do, Charles, is drop one of those bags, put it down, and then want to try on a shirt, a jacket, or something, and put it up to see. And when they drop that bag, that person is watching them wait, walking in the store, following behind them, grab that bag, walk out the door. Is that alarm going to go off if they're in Bloomingdale's and they got a Saks Fifth Avenue bag? Is it going to go off? No. Most amount of money. Least amount of time, least amount of effort. I got something that came from another store, paid for, got the receipt. I'm good. How much risk do I take, Charles? Not a lot. Most people don't want the risk. They just want to get in and out. They don't want to be stopped. They don't want a barrier. They want but to you got tourists. Charles, this is like being in, 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 the, in the Apple Grove. You know, it's like you, you, you get your pick of the tourists because you see them coming in with bags. Yeah. So we had to watch the tourists to see that they don't drip, put their bags down. I said, because I had to tell, you know, stores, some of the stores we used to do training for in the high end stores says, look, you got to look for the backdoor people. So what's the backdoor people? These are the people that are going to prey on the tourists. They're mm -hmm. not going to they're not going to rob the tourists. They're just going to wait for the tourists to put the bag down. And they're going to pick it up and keep it moving and walk out the store. He said, yeah, well, so I never thought about that. I said, well, don't become a criminal. I'm, Mr. Kearney is not here to teach criminal. I'm not teaching criminal one on one. I'm just telling you what we look out for. But what you make a great, great point where, you know, we kind of have to keep an eye on all of the, the things that have happened so we prevent them from happening. You know, you, you know, we talked about this earlier. How many have you trained over the years? Tens of thousands of students. How, how do you stay up to date? Um, you know, what would you recommend for continuous like professional development uh, for somebody else who's a new security guard? Sometimes you got to look at, you got to come out of your comfort zone of work and security because you get locked into one thing. But when you, you experience a little bit, I'm not saying you have to do all of these things to get skilled, but sure. when you find areas of security that you have an interest in, you're going to see the quality of your work jump up. Right. Right. Absolutely. right? Teaching. I like te love teaching and interviewing. I've been probably interviewed about 30 to 40,000 people. For jobs, wow. right? You know, so, so people come in, and I can tell that they're nervous. I said, "Look, uh, I'm going to get some water. I'm going to sit down, relax." I see people coming and shake. I said, "Hey, I'm, listen, um, I'll be right back." Hey, relax. And some people come in, and they couldn't, they couldn't, you know. I said, "What's your name? <laughs> Where you live? How long you been living there?" Right, and then I just change the subject. So, okay, so you've been living there how long? Okay. So you put your address down on here. You still live there? Then I just go into it and just take them off their minds that, like, where I live? They, that's it's easy. Where do I live? How long yeah. have you been living there? I just take them out of the, the context of nervousness because I can see that they're nervous. All right? But, you you know, you get a chance to interview people and you get a chance to prepare you for when you got to get reports, which is the, the major topic. When you got to get information for people, you got to know, like Charles said, you got to know how to, you got to have the right attitude. That's what we teach in the, in the on the job training. We get into your attitude because your attitude 
will will distract for just dis, you know distract people you know they'll be, they'll be turned off well they keep things close to the vest because they don't like the way you two approach them right you can't be antagonistic towards them even if you suspect them to be have done something wrong you still got to you guys still got to op ask open-ended questions no I, I totally agree and you're right it's the asking the right question you know you don't want just like a quick yes or no um you want to ask a question where they're going to have to kind of engage and not blow you off um you know there's so many resources out resources out there folks and there's a lot of free things as well um so if you take training with guardian group services you know we talk about it in our classes in the pre-assignment and the 16 hour um there's a lot of free resources out there that you should take advantage of um instructor Kearney, i'm gonna end with this last question what has been your most memorable class so far and why um it's it's kind of corny but it's, it's, it's the most memorable class before covid um uh was a, probably one of the last next to last classes that we did before covid because we didn't know covid was coming yeah. and so uh lunchtime this is very rare but all of the students went out and they came back they left out for lunch now normally i've never seen everybody go out for lunch maybe one or two but mostly but they didn't come back on time and it's like what's, what happened no what's what's going on right because i was like that doesn't sound right like everybody left and then everybody nobody's back i'm like sitting like where's everybody i didn't i didn't call no nobody i said i didn't say nothing to bruce or nobody i said where they at something's wrong what happened what did, what did they what they didn't like me or what i don't know what happened so they came back and they brought me a thank you card so they had to have everybody sign it so that was uh. <laughs> well, it was only a few minutes but i was like i didn't see nobody i'm like wait hold it they know what time is supposed to be. Mr. Carney said, come back at this time. I'm looking at them. I'm like, I'm going to blast all of these kids, but they don't get back on time. And they came back and gave me a you know, card saying, thank you. We like the class. Da, da, da. And they had they had to sign it outside. So they wanted to do everything outside the classroom. They didn't even do it in the hallway, Charles. They did it down outside. Because I'm looking, I'm looking outside, looked out the hallway, nobody there. I said, how could all these like 20 something people, almost 30 people, where, how come none of them is there? I know for me, um... I've had students that I've done training for five and 10 years ago, come back and email me or I just, you know, I run into them in, in the street or catch them on the train. And they're like, yo, the, the training helped me kind of advance, double my salary. Um, and those are stories I always love to hear um, because I think that's why we get in this field as instructors. Um, we want to kind of be the facilitators to get information to help people get licenses to, to kind of better themselves um so you know it, it's always nice to get a good instructor someone who's going to really facilitate information um you know in your classes specifically you do really good role playing sessions report writing sessions to make it kind of click um you know so sometimes an instructor will just babble and babble and be extremely boring and no, yeah, I, you're I, not. I, I, no, I, I wanted to piggyback on that because I can tell you, I'm, I won't mention the company that I work for, right? And <clears throat> I was actually working full time, and I was doing training for this company on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. So the owner of the school was an instructor. It was his school, and so he had class one classroom, and I had the other classroom. We're teaching them both the same class, the eight hour pre-assignment class. So on the breaks, it wouldn't a week go by with the students in his class would say, Mr. Kearney, can I come into your class? <laughs> I said, what is, what's wrong? They said, he's just reading from the book. We're falling asleep. He's reading from the book. Now, how am I going to tell the owner of the company <laughs> that they students are so poor? They said, please, can I come into your class? I can't make it. I'm not going to make it through the rest of the day. He's reading. He's literally reading the chapters of each section of the manual of what oh. we're going to teach. And they were like, and I go past to see what happens. I come in. I had to go past the class. So they were like this. 
<laughs> they were like, okay, they were like, like oh, no. <laughs> no, like, see, I could slip by to get it because I had the main class. He had a smaller class. And they would come on the morning break, the afternoon break. and said, please, can I come? I said, I, I said, I can <laughs> All right. So with that said, right, I appreciate you, uh, Instructor Kearney. I always like to end these with a little bit of fun. I'm going to hit you with a bunch of questions and they're this or that um, rapid fire. I'll give them to you. You just tell me the first answer that comes to mind. OK. OK. Got it. A little fun at the end. When it comes to snacks, sweet or savory? Uh, savory. Savory. All right. Are you a morning person or a night owl? Um, both. All right. <laughs> I stay up late. <laughs> Sometimes I, I got to get up early. Uh, meet your favorite actor or meet your favorite musician. Um, probably musician because I like music. I like oh, actors yeah. too, but uh, man, actors, I see actors. I'm like, I, I'm not into the, the celebrities. I'm into music. If they, if I meet a musician, then that's going to be different. Absolutely. Okay. What about, uh, books or movies? Um, Man, you're giving me hard things to do. Uh, the, I, I will read old books, and I I like to watch old movies. So I'm I'm into both of them. It's like it's kind of like hard because if I get a book and you say, "Hey, you read this book. You're gonna like this book. I'll read it." And then you say, "Hey, watch this movie." I said that movie is thirty. I was Charles. Before, I I used to have cable, right? But I used to watch movies from the 1920s. I said, "There's something wrong with me. I'm watching." You know, you know, James Cagney when he was young kid. I'm watching these movies, but I like them. And I was like, nobody's gonna watch them with me because my kids are like, you're crazy, Dad. You watching? What is that movie? I don't even. Those people are so old that the movie's so screen. You know how the screen is has the, the scratchiness on the screen. They said, what are you watching? I said, I'm watching. Uh, so, so, oh gosh, they like, Dad, please don't. But All yes. right. So let's say. Um, you get put into a movie. Are you a superhero or a villain? Um, I, I'd rather be the superhero guy. It helps people out. Okay. Uh, sports. You prefer baseball or football? Um, <clears throat> see, baseball I was concerned about because I didn't want something not coming at my head at 90 miles an hour. So I said, well, football, if I miss it, it's not going to have that kind of speed. If it hits me in the head, I'll be all right. But a baseball hit me in the head. I've seen too many pitchers. You know, the, you know, the dust somebody or, you know, like that guy just hit a home run. And then the next time up, I said, uh oh, here it come. Let me, I mean, how, how many is going to be 100 miles an hour, 110. So yeah, I said, next, no, football. Yeah, next always pays the price. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I said, no, football, baseball, no, baseball. I, I, I like the baseball, but I said, no, I wouldn't. See, I would be that guy. I don't know if you watch any of the players that would get mad as hell. With that baseball bat, because somebody throw a baseball at my head at 90, 100 miles an hour, a brush back, and you hit me. Oh no, no, no! I would not. I would not. I would not have survived Major League Baseball. Because I would not have. I would have. Been, it would have been a wrap. No, you're not hitting me in the head with baseball. Chess so. or checkers? Um, I don't know too much about chess. I know. To, I know how to play it, but I, I, I really wasn't so much into chess and checkers. I was like, you know what? Okay. I was into, into physicals, you know, like it's games, it's, it's brain yeah. stuff. I, yeah. All right. Um, what do you think is more important? Always being on time or always being right? I don't think anybody is always right, but uh, always being on time is something that you you got you got to strive for. You got to strive, especially in this industry, because guess what? You ain't always gonna be right, but if you're always on time, I bet you keep the job more than the person that thinks they's always right. <laughs> Awesome. And the last one, most importantly, would you rather reward people for being good or punish people for being bad? Um, I like more rewarding of people, right? Because, you know, when you got to take away somebody's job, I mean, being a director of personnel, you don't want to take away someone's job. Yeah. And so we give you warnings, but there's so many warnings you can give because you can jeopardize the client. Your, your account by oh, yeah, giving yeah. someone too many breaks. So you want to encourage people to, you know, do the job, you know, as Charles mentioned earlier, commit to memory to post orders and procedures. And if you don't an understand, ask questions, but get the answer. And if you don't, can't do it yourself, 
because it's outside the scope, make sure you get the right person and you won't go wrong, right? You won't be on the bad side. You'll always be on the good side. Even if you make mistakes because it'll be a mistake that you made because, you know, um, you didn't try to do it yourself, but you, you know, just need to know a little bit more about the job and that's okay. You get a client that will go along with that. No problem. It, it, I, I agree with you a thousand percent. You know, if you own up, hey, I made a mistake, you could always learn from it. But if you lie and hide it, no good. Instructor Kearney, thank you so much for uh, for joining us. I just want to thank everybody for tuning in, watching this episode, um, getting to a chance to meet our instructors. Drop a comment. Let us know what training you would like to see us do in the future. Uh, always check our website out. We have everything listed there with the dates and the times. Stay safe, stay alert, stay alive.